All right, good morning, everyone. I, Linda Lunn, hereby call the Board of Education special meeting to order at 9 a.m. The following teleconference meeting practices will be in place. Each board member will be called upon by name and given the opportunity to make a brief comment, if desired, on each item. A roll call vote will be conducted after the opportunity for comment. Please note that this meeting is being audio recorded. Item A1, establishment of quorum, will be by roll call. Please acknowledge your presence when your name is called. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon, I believe you may be muted. I will oh. come back to you. No, present. I am present. Thank you. I did. I was muted, but I'm present. Mr. Diffley. Present. Mr. Rivas. Present. Mrs. Tomasian. I'm here. And Linda Lund, we have a quorum for all board members in attendance. Item A2, Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Rivas, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, thank you. Ready, begin. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One day, one nation, under God, under God, indivisible, 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 indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Rivas. Item A3, approval of the agenda. We've received a request to pull an agenda item. That's item B5, authorization for self-contained classroom teachers to teach in a departmentalized setting. Do I have an motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. I'll move. All right, I've got motion by Mr. Dixon and second by Mrs. Tomasian. Any comments, Mr. Dixon? Motion by Mr. Diffley. I think, yes, I think it was Mr. Diffley, but. Okay, uh, okay I corrected. I have a motion by Mr. Diffley and a second by Mrs. Tomasian. Mr. Dixon, any comments? Uh, none. Mr. Diffley? None. Mr. Rivas? No comment. Mrs. Tomasian? No. Roll call vote, Mrs. Tomasian. Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mr. Diffley? Aye. Mr. Dixon? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries 5 0. Item A4 public comment regarding me meeting agenda items. Individuals wishing, wishing to address the board were asked to submit their comments in writing by 7 a.m. today. Staff members will facilitate the reading of public comment submissions. In accordance with board bylaw 9323, each individual public comment shall be allowed a three minute reading. The governing board shall limit the total time for public in input on each item to no more than 20 minutes. No action or discussion shall be undertaken by the board on any item not appearing on the posted agenda except as authorized by law. 188 public comments have been submitted for today's meeting. All board members have been provided a copy of every public comment received for today's meeting. Members of the public may view the comments submitted on the district website without names and addresses to protect the privacy of individual submissions. These will be posted on Monday. Comments that will be read aloud today were randomly selected to depict a fair representation of the overall comments received. Mrs. Diaz? Yes, and those comments will be posted on the homepage of the district website under the Reopening Schools tab as it goes along with that information. So I'll begin with our first comment and we have several staff members here to help read them. First one is from Patty Owen. I am nervous and anxious about the idea of schools reopening for in-classroom learning with little safeguards that can actually be enforced. I am concerned what will happen when, not if, the first student tests positive. What will the protocols be? Is it too short of a time frame to hear the board's proposal and then have to register just four days later with a definitive answer as to how we want our children to be enrolled? The board should make a decision for 100% at home learning to start the school year. With that said, the curriculum and software needs to be implemented by all teachers, and the work needs to be uniform across grade level classes. 
all Math 1 students learning the same material, etc. And all teachers need to follow the same format for providing lessons, assignments, and submissions of work. The end of the 2019-2020 school year for high school students was not efficient. Each te teacher posted assignments and graded differently. It was not equitable. The uncertainty that comes with this virus is causing so much anxiety for parents and students alike. While I understand wanting to provide options, these options are creating further stress and anxiety. A firm and decisive plan needs to be implemented that all students stay home for the beginning, if not all, of the fall semester. Megan Martinez. My children need to be in school. I am a teacher in the district and I can tell you that even being a teacher, they are not getting the same education as they would if they were in school. I think of all those kids that don't have parents to support them at home. I think about all those students who are mentally unstable and they need this. Students should return in August. Parents and teachers should have the right to pick what they are comfortable with. I want to go back to the classroom and I want my kids to return as well. Susan Moyer. As a teacher, I really want to return to school. I miss my kids, my colleagues, and my job. But I have some big concerns for the health and well being of all. My hope is that if we return, parents will take the precautions seriously and not send sick kids to school or fight us on district guidelines set forth to protect all. I have faith in our I have faith that our district will do what they believe is the right thing. They've shown us they have our best interest at heart. I want to stress though that my concerns are big ones at this point based on local numbers of infection and some, some community members refusing to take precautions seriously. Stephanie Alvarado. I'm writing in regards to the safety of our children, teachers, and staff. I'm asking that you please do the right thing and listen to science, medical professionals, and teachers. They are all saying it is unsafe to send children back right now. Our numbers are going up every single day. We have no idea how children will be affected by COVID-19 since they have not been in school. There are so many unknowns. We must do everything we can to keep each other safe during these hard times. Please do not ignore the facts. Please do not ignore science. Please do not turn your backs on the children, teachers, and families of this community. If schools need to be reopened, I am asking that you please make masks mandatory. It will save lives. Thank you. Chloe Patterson. As a student, I believe opening the school in the fall is crucial for the educational development of my peers and I. I find online school harder and less effective than traditional school. It is a lot easier for me to learn and grasp the information when a teacher is explaining it in depth rather than reading information off a screen. It's also easier to ask questions and get the correct response in a classroom compared to an email. Socializing is another essential for students and, and using online school takes that away. In addition, Opening sports and extracurricular activities would be greatly appreciated. Sports is a way for a lot of kids to stay active and express themselves in ways a lot of other things can't. I personally really miss school and sports and I would be thrilled to go back in the fall. Rachel Cobian. Hello, it is my recommendation that MBUSD follow the example of LAUSD and provide distance learning only for the 2021 school year. Due to the increasing COVID-19 levels in Riverside County, I am concerned about the health of Marietta teachers, lunch aides, administrators, students, and families. Although COVID-19 appears to present less severe symptoms in children, they can still pass it on to adults or family members that may have compromised immune systems. Furthermore, no strategy has been presented to address what happens if someone at the school gets COVID. Temperature readings may be helpful in some cases, but many people with COVID are asymptomatic. Will the whole school shut down for two weeks or longer as people quarantine? I understand that many of our residents are concerned about their careers and businesses, 
But in this case, we must put people over profits. We must be even more aggressive with our social distancing measures than we were in April when our numbers were significantly lower. This is the only way to flatten the curve until a reliable vaccine is developed. Please keep the kids home and focus on developing a robust and comprehensive distance learning curriculum for regular and special needs kids. Thank you. Danny, teachers have always been considered essential workers and are important for the health and well being of our society. This is also the reason the teachers union and the teaching profession are held in a very high esteem by most, myself included. Essential workers such as doctors, nurses, paramedics, firefighters, police officers, grocery store workers, truck drivers, and many, many more professions have adapted with new safeguards, guidelines, and continued to work. The healthcare and emergency services has continued to respond to suspected and known COVID patients. They wear profession, personal protective equipment for their entire shift and sanitize multiple times a day. They also wear PAPRs, which provide greater protection than masks and are designed to be worn for up to eight hours a day. I say all of this to ask these questions. Why do teachers believe they are different than the rest of the essential workers? Why do they believe they should be allowed to stay at home when other essential workers have been on the front lines? Why do teachers believe they are at a greater risk than the above mentioned essential workers? Finally, why should we continue to pay teachers that refuse to adapt to get back to work? Telework makes sense in some circumstances, but not for K-12 education. I am disappointed that many teachers believe they are more important than the kids they are paid to teach. I am disappointed that many teachers have no regard for two income families that have no way of teaching their kids at home. Do your job, get teachers back to work. Thank you. Michelle Millett. I am writing in support of the three learning models that the district is proposing. I believe as a parent and educator within the district that giving parents the choice of schooling that fits the needs of their family as well as giving staff the same choice for their family is paramount. I have many coworkers and friends who are not comfortable returning to school in the traditional model for a number of reasons. I support them on their choice. However, I am speaking from my family and experience from when we went into lockdown back in March. Despite feeling confident that my family would weather this and we would be fine, it has been a struggle for us. I am a special education teacher and I saw my workload dramatically increase when we went to distance learning. I spoke with colleagues who were in the general education setting and while many experienced the same thing, their workload did not increase as greatly as special education. It was very difficult to complete honest and true IEPs due to the non-graded status of classes. Many students didn't complete work that teachers assigned because they either didn't have access, their family situation wasn't conducive to a good learning environment, or because kids were happy with, the, with their grade when we went out. This did not help case carriers on being able to assess where students were with their goals and abilities. Many families would not return calls or emails, no matter what we try to do to make the connection with the student or family. This made it extremely hard and added more pressure to our jobs. I contacted one of my admins several times to discuss the stress and pressure we were feeling as educators. We can't meet the needs of our special education population strictly online. It is not beneficial to those students. I had to juggle not only my, not only my own children suffered. I have a son who struggled a lot in middle school and it finally clicked and he was doing well in eighth grade. That changed when we went to distance learning. He began struggling again. He started to hate school. He kept telling me he just wants to be back in the classroom with his teacher and his peers. My other son, who was in advanced classes, didn't feel connected to the material 
or to his teachers. He loves being in the classroom with his teachers and his peers. My boys are both avid video game players and they did not like sitting in front of the computer completing their work. They actually avoided video games until school got out because it was too much for them. Myself and my boys have started to struggle with our mental health. We didn't have any issues prior to this, but it has been hard for us to be at home with no other contact from our peers. My boys and I have cried thinking about not returning to school. It is bringing up issues of isolation and depression that are not good. Research has shown that when mental health is compromised, a person is at higher risk for health problems. For our family, returning to some kind of normal is for our well-being. I do support the choice to choose which learning path is best for families and teachers. That is time. Next comment, Teresa Rhodes. I teach in a classroom smaller than my two car garage. It is impossible to properly physically distance my sped kids and the paraprofessionals in the space I have. I am very concerned about returning to school with such a crowded room and no guarantee that folks are following protocols outside of school or for that matter at school. Additionally, if it's unsafe for our MEA and school board to meet face to face, which it is, why would anyone think it's safe for teachers to be face to face with students? Other districts have already decided to do distance learning for this year because of increasing numbers of hospitalizations in the area. We have increasing numbers too, which is why things are being shut down again. So I'm not sure why face to face instruction is even still on the table. And finally, if we don't have a doctor's note saying we're high risk, we just have to suck it up. I don't think that's right either. I personally am terrified at this point. I don't even leave my house. I don't see my children or family, but I'm expected to return to school in four weeks for face to face instruction. It is my belief that we need to put the safety of our students and staff first. We should not reopen schools at this time. If we are forced to, then I believe we should adopt a split day so we have half of our kids in the morning and half in the afternoon. But even with that, I think we wait till numbers are way down and our community is open. Michelle Weaver. Dear Board of Education, I am strongly in favor of full time traditional schooling without masks. COVID-19 threw us all a curveball that we were not expecting. When our schools and nation shut down in the spring, we were all caught off guard and scrambled to finish out the school year any way possible. I completely understand why the spring semester was what it was. However, it was by no means a continuation of the planned curriculum and is not an acceptable form of education moving forward. Although my kids completed the daily weekly participation, they did not learn much. Their education suffered greatly, as did their social interaction and mental health. I watched as my kids received zero instruction via Zoom Google meetings while other school districts had their teachers meeting with their students every day and teaching new material. I know this firsthand from a teacher in Las Virginas School District and students in the LAUSD. For the first time, I was disappointed in our school district. Disappointed MVUSD was not doing everything possible to elevate the level of teaching and continue having the teachers actually teach new material instead of just assign material. Embarrassed that kids in the LAUSD were getting more of an education than mine. This fall, the students need in-person instruction. They need in-person social interactions with their peers. Without in-person instruction, I worry our children will fall permanently behind on academics. I am much more fearful of the long-term repercussions on their academics and mental health than I am about the kids contracting COVID and or bringing it home to grandma. The percentage of our total population infected by COVID is minuscule, roughly 1%. At some point, we will look back on this period and be amazed we shut down our entire country for the tiny percentage of people affected. Please do the right thing. Think of our kids. Think of the quality of education that they will receive in person versus online. Save one or more teens from suicide. Do not give in to the hysteria. 
We count on you to think logically and with the best interests of our students as your top priority. Thank you for your time. Amanda Heffington. It is not safe to have children in school. There needs to be an online system until this pandemic is over. I am considering enrolling my child in a private online school if this district does not make an intelligent decision on this. It is not safe. Rose. My son is entering his senior year and doesn't do well with online learning. Please return to traditional learning in the classroom. David. I am an active duty service member who is getting deployed this school year. I have kids in high school and elementary school. My wife also works 10 hours a day. It is imperative that our children be in school, especially while I'm gone and not physically able to be here with my family. My children are already suffering mentally from being locked in the house all day for months on end. Please reopen schools. Carrie Norman. I am adamantly opposed to the concept of returning to our school environment in a traditional model that the district is proposing. To say that I was shocked to see this proposed model, which encompasses learn, returning to the classroom with traditional numbers of students in which the district states six feet social distancing not guaranteed is an understatement. I will be very direct. This is an absurd idea that is insulting to all teachers and staff within our schools. In no way would this decision show responsible or professional practice from MVUSD, especially given our recent surge in cases of the virus in Riverside County. Hundreds of teachers and staff willingly took the professional opportunity to complete the leading edge online certification in order to serve our students in the most rigorous online format possible. We are letting precious time go by when we could be preparing for our August return in a virtual format that far exceeds what students were offered the last two months of the school year. Returning to the classroom in any capacity that exposes teachers, staff, and students to hundreds of people per day is negligent, irresponsible, and a platform for disaster. I have compassion for families that are facing hardships with returning to work and potentially having childcare conflicts, but this is not an acceptable reason to return to our learning environment in any traditional capacity. To be clear, I do believe in-person teaching is best for students during a time when we are not facing a pandemic of this nature. I am opposed to anything but a 100% virtual academic platform for the start of our school year. Reagan Seneff. I am a student at Vista Murrieta High School. I am concerned about going back to school and the three models you are still going off of. I feel as a student that if I chose to go hybrid, I wouldn't feel safe going to school since you cannot control outside influences. I was very much leaning towards going hybrid because I felt it was a good balance, but you, but you all can't guarantee the safety of my fellow students and I. My grandmother is immunocompromised and could die if she gets this virus. I am horrified of being the reason the virus would come home with me. I felt if I chose distance learning and even hybrid, I would fall behind my fellow classmates. As a junior, this is a very important year for my education and to colleges. I want to have some of the same opportunities as my fellow classmates and not feel that I am left in the dark about topics. I feel if we all start distance learning in the fall and play it ear by ear and go back to school in the spring, we would all be at the same point in our educations. It would make me feel more comfortable not having to make such a tough decision about my education based on foggy learning structures and no idea how safety precautions will be made at my school. With 4,000 students coming in and out of campus, I feel you can't guarantee me safety. Thank you for your time. Kenneth Mathis, ladies and gentlemen, you have an, an enviable task in front of you that affects the lives of so many children. On one hand, you have valid concerns about the health and welfare of students and staff. On the other hand, you have the educational needs of these same children, needs that in many cases will not be met if they continue down the online educational path. I am speaking specifically about your special education students. 
that must have hands-on support to achieve any kind of positive learning outcome. When you compare the educational method of a special education classroom led by special education professionals and that of a standard online educational system, there is no comparison. In the classroom, external stimulation is reduced combined with positive redirection into short bursts of the learning activity that helps the student focus and achieve a higher degree of progress in their studies. There is a real difference between long form computer learning and the shorter direct form used to segment lessons into manageable bites for the students with short attention spans. Because this difference is so dramatic, we are requesting that you consider the needs of your special education students separately from the general education student population. There are a smaller subgroup of the student population that can be better managed under a COVID plan. Whether brought together at one district school or in small groups at their local school, these students need to come back to school. Many will not be able to study at home and therefore not get any education this year. Think about your own kids. What would it be like for them to go a year without educational attainment? Please do not let this generation of special needs children be the lost generation of students the system failed to help. You can creatively solve this problem if you put your minds to it. We have faith in your good judgment to do the right thing. Rachel Filer, regarding item A6. The proposed new board policy BP 0470 COVID-19 mitigation plan clearly reflects a great deal of time, energy, and thoughtfulness on the part of its authors. I appreciate that the board recognizes that staff as well as students have the right to a safe campus that protects their physical and psychological health and well-being. I also agree with the board that the consequences of this pandemic are far reaching and require extraordinary measures to, of support for students, families, and staff. My concern for the mitigation plan are not with the particulars, but rather with the spirit of the plan. It seems to devalue the quality of learning that is possible in an online environment and perhaps gives more credit than is due to the learning that will take place in an in-person traditional model in the context of the pandemic. While the mitigation plan includes options for blended and online instruction, it clearly seems to, in, to favor in-person instruction for all students. There is no doubt that last year's abrupt transition to distance learning had many flaws. Now, however, we have an opportunity to demonstrate that online learning can be rigorous, standards-driven, and beneficial for students. Online learning is not the best choice for all students, but neither is a return to the pre-COVID status quo of traditional instruction. Rather than viewing a hybrid or online model as a lesser option necessitated by current conditions, we should devote the appropriate resources into developing online hybrid programs that can become part of our district's offerings for the long term. I ask the board to be mindful in your decision making and your communication to the community. Please do not make or convey assumptions that online education is settling or that students who learn in an online or hybrid model will somehow receive less of an education than students who return to the physical classroom. Instead, be clear that no matter how they learn, all students in Marietta Valley Unified School District will receive the quality of education our community expects from us. Our community expects us to educate their children while keeping them safe. In a time when placing children and staff in classrooms poses a clear and present danger to everyone, we shouldn't ask parents to choose between a quality education and their child's safety. Give them the best of both options by promoting and supporting quality online instruction for as many students as is reasonable and appropriate. Ms. Slung, that concludes the time we've allotted for public comment. Thank you, Thank you to, to all, of, all, of, all, of all of our staff, staff members who were able, were able to read, to those, read those for us. For us. And, next and next we'll go to item A5, 
reopening schools update. This is an information item. Good morning, board members, President Lunn. I want to thank you so much uh, uh, for convening this morning. For everyone in our uh, in the audience listening in today, it's important to note uh, that this is not an action item. Action, should it still be warranted, will be undertaken um, uh, no later than July 29th, 2020 by the Board of Education. This is an opportunity to discuss and hear information about preparations that are occurring and truly very fast moving circumstances within our state that I'll be speaking to. So board members, as we consider reopening considerations, the overarching goals that guide us is that we want to return to school, we want to return safely, and we want to return smoothly. We will follow all the rules and regulations and orders that may be present, and we will promote the guidance initiatives to the greatest extent possible. It is critical to understand that while there are things in our control, in this pandemic environment, there are more variables outside of our control. But let's keep our eyes on these three guiding practices. Return to school, return safely, return smoothly. These are all like puzzle pieces and they may not all fit together perfectly today, but they will at some point. Board members, we are not asking for you to make any final determinations today, but we'll be looking for your guiding statements as we respond to both the required and needed shifts that may emerge each day. As we listen to the comments that were expressed this morning, you can see that they span the gamut of what people believe. It isn't the varied opinions that I find concerning at all. I value all of those opinions, and I believe they contain aspects of validity and truth and wisdom. It is the manner in which I've, I have observed some voices from both viewpoints of an issue related to reopening and the way that those opinions have been expressed. Let's be clear, there are no bad guys in this debate. Individuals who want to frame the debate as only one option or consideration matters is minimizing the complexity of a worldwide pandemic and how to help our students, families, and staff in Marietta best emerge from the pandemic being stronger and healthier for the long term. There are some truths that, gu that guide us, both physical and mental health of the, and safety of our students and staff and their families are very important. So is to the economic health of the community and that will impact the physical and mental health of our community. And it's also important to acknowledge that the pandemic's trends change and they are different today than they were just a month ago. As such, we must prepare for reasonable responses to conditions and prepare wisely for shifts that are needed. Today's presentation from our senior staff will outline the educational and operational preparation that has been planned that will be used in some form at some point. Whether we open traditionally in a blended manner, virtually or a combination of all, each of these aspects that you hear, to, hear today will have some level of implementation needed. But our goals will remain the same. Let's return to school when we can return safely and return smoothly. Now, while we're having this very important board meeting today, we're likely not the biggest show in town. I think most people may have heard that the governor will be holding a news conference at 12 o'clock today. Uh, we are seeing that there will be discussions in regards to reopening and guidance that is issued at a state level. This will also include guidance related to issues such as masks. As such, please listen carefully to the governor's news conference as tw at 12 o'clock. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that it is important to listen to all the models that are going to be uh, shared today by our staff. While any single one of the options may not be an individual's personal preference today, it may nevertheless be applicable to people as we go forward 
forward based on what this message from the governor is. So having said that, I'd like to take us to the first page of our presentation. I want to acknowledge and I want to thank literally hundreds of staff members who have been working on task forces throughout the summer. And you can see these task forces have been divided into four different areas, governance, business operations, educational services, and human resources. And each bullet under, under those categories is its own task force comprised of many, many people who have been devoting many hours to talk about the very minuscule pieces that need to be in place in order to effectively uh, address the issues that, that are there. And so I want to thank uh, those folks. Uh, they are staff members, they, they are parents, they are teachers, they, are, they have been people who have uh, given of their time uh, uh, freely uh, over the course of this summer in order to do the best thing for our community. And I am confident that all the work that is done is going to be needed at some point in time. And so the work is, is uh, uh, certainly going to be valuable. Having said that, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Mrs. Mary Walters, who will share the educational services aspects uh, that have been worked on. Mrs. Walters. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. and all who are in attendance today. I hope everyone is doing well this morning. District office, teachers and classified staff have been collaborating and meeting for the past few months on the return to school models and procedures. As Mr. Kelly stated, the pandemic is ever changing and requires all of us to be understanding, collaborative and above all else nimble. This morning we will share our plans at this point in time. If you could take me to the next slide. This morning, some of our educational services staff, Faith Muchnick, Jennifer Schreiber, Jana Preston, and Dale Velk will be sharing information on the following. Our virtual summer school programs that we held, centralized enrollment, our calendar for the upcoming school year with modifications, our learning models that we've been working on, our co-curricular activities, including athletics, and our registration next steps. Next slide, please. I'd like to share a little information on our elementary extended learning opportunity that was provided to 131 students this summer, which is similar to the numbers that we have had in previous years. This summer opportunity provided our students with daily virtual live instruction and time to make valuable social emotional connections with each other and staff. There were interactive lessons daily which you can see from our from the screenshots. The top left screen shot is, a, is from a teacher's morning meeting to review the activities for the day. The bottom left screen is a virtual whiteboard where the teacher was doing a lesson on adjectives. The screen on the right shows one of our elementary teachers providing live instruction. Teachers felt that the successes were the live instruction the ability for students to have their social emotional connections with each other and their teacher, and they felt that the staff collaboration during summer school was amazing and the ability to work together to provide quality virtual instruction. Teachers stated that technology device and connectivity was difficult and a struggle at times and with some students based on the type of device and Internet. In addition, teachers struggled with the ability to evaluate student work, especially written assignments, and adjust lessons to ensure student learning. Next slide, please. This slide is our high school summer school, is, which was pr primarily designed for credit recovery. We had 699 students participate in virtual summer school due to the flexibility of it being offered virtually. This is the highest number of students participating in summer school, which is about 100 students more than average. The screenshot on the left is an English one assignment short story. Teachers were highly communicative with their students. They were very flexible and worked with their students to help them be successful in the courses. 
approximately 75% of the students completed a course successfully at the end of summer school. Staff felt that more students struggled to successfully complete courses due to technology issues, lack of participation attendance, and the need for in-person support because they had previously been un unsuccessful at completing the course. Staff felt that if summer school were offered in a hybrid model, virtual and on-campus instruction, students would be more successful. The other um, screenshot is from our Summer Bridge program, and that is designed for incoming ninth grade students that provide students with the skills to help them navigate and be more successful in high school. These skills include organizational skills, communication skills, time management, team building, social emotional well-being, use of online platforms, school involvement and connections, coursework, which includes college prep and CTE, the importance of grades and transcripts, and post-secondary education. Currently, there are over 350 students registered, which is over three times the average enrollment. So we're very excited about this. Students will receive two and a half elective credits for successful completion of this week long course. Next slide, please. And this slide is our extended school year, which is for our students with disabilities. We had 63 students um, participate this summer virtually, which is about a third of our average attendance. Teachers felt many students who struggled in the traditional classroom did well in the virtual setting. ESY provided our students the opportunity to socialize with each other and their teacher and instructional assistants. The students look forward to engaging in the interactive curriculum. The teachers and instructional assistants included activities such as virtual storytelling, live puppet shows, cooking and cooking demonstrations. Teachers shared that there were challenges that included technology device and connection issues, as well as the need for parental support and participation to assist their students, especially the younger students. Additionally, teachers struggled with receiving written assignments and authentic student work. Teachers shared they were very anxious about a virtual ESY program because of the unknowns, but felt more comfortable quickly and felt it was a wonderful experience for students and staff. Next slide. So due to school closures and distance learning in the spring, we felt that we needed to provide families the opportunity to register their students for the upcoming school year. The district office provided space for two guidance techs in one of our conference rooms so they could connect families who had not completed registration, answer phone calls, and personally enroll students for those families who requested an appointment. Our district on average registers approximately 150 students per month. Centralized enrollment had a positive impact on student enrollment, and we registered 329 students during that month. Additionally, we currently have 2,166 inter-district transfers. That is from outside of our district boundaries. We are down approximately two to 300 transfers at this time from our annual transfer numbers, but feel we will receive those transfers now that school district office school district offices are open for business and our current projected enrollment is 23,268 which is only about one to 200 students less than our annual enrollment our enrollment is looking good at this time and are hopeful we will maintain that enrollment mrs walter yes ma'am um can i ask you to talk a little bit about what um state or senate bill 98 um, is doing about the um, average daily attendance provisions for this school year. I know people are concerned about that. I think we, we, we may cover that in, in our future oh. slides. So um, if we don't, can we go back to that? You bet, thank you. Thank you. All right, next slide on our school calendar. So board members, you have an agenda item on the adjusted 2021 school year calendar. We have been working with our teachers association to adjust our student calendar to move all professional development days to the beginning of the school year. We feel this movement of professional development days will help our staff to prepare for the upcoming school year. 
our two district focus areas for the 2021 school year are offering a quality education in a pandemic environment and boldly and aggressively advocating for justice and equity for students, parents, and staff. We plan to offer training on the following areas, health and safety site procedures, learning models and student teacher expectations, equity, and our new learning management system canvas. Our first day of for students will be on August 14th. School levels and sites are working on plans for the first day to offer it in a virtual manner to include health and safety site procedures, canvas and student expectations for the learning model. OK, next slide. Now we're going to move into our learning models. As I said at the beginning of our presentation this morning, district office, teachers and classified staff have been collaborating and meeting for the past few months on the return to school models. We will share with you our planning and direction at this time for the upcoming school year. As you know, things are changing dramatically on a daily basis and could change today, which requires us to be nimble. On Wednesday, our state superintendent, Tony Thurman, encouraged schools to continue designing plans for traditional in-person instruction this fall, but urged us to prepare for the possibility of resuming distance learning, which is our virtual model, based on current health and safety conditions. COVID-19 infections continue to rise, and some of the state's largest school districts have announced plans to resume learning virtually this fall. With that information from our state superintendent, we continue to plan for all three learning models, which is virtual, blended, and traditional, because we feel all three of these models would be offered at some point during the upcoming school year. We surveyed our families in June and have families interested in each of the learning models due to family choice and health-related concerns. Our goal is for students to return to school in person. But as Mr. Kelly said, but we wanted to open school safely and smoothly for students, staff, and families. I would like to introduce our Executive Director of Elementary Education, Faith Muchnick Jacks, to lead us through the next slide on the virtual model. Okay, good morning board members and stakeholders who have tuned in today. It's my pleasure to begin the discussion about our three instructional models, starting with the virtual model. I want to remind you, as Ms. Walter said, that our task forces, both elementary and secondary, have been developing these three models based on our intention to meet the individual needs of students and families, based on parent choice. As we go through our presentation today, we will also be pointing out how these models might look if all students need to move into them during the course of the school year. I will begin with the schedule of learning. At the elementary level, we have developed a program that focuses structured academics, including live instruction, in the morning hours, five days a week. This will be time for direct instructional activities. The afternoons will focus on applying learning, receiving intervention or learning support, and extension or enrichment opportunities for all students. The afternoon will still be part of the school day, but it may vary based on student needs. At the secondary level, the schedule for learning will follow the student's regular daily schedule. In both elementary and secondary, learning activities in the virtual model will look very different from the distance learning experienced in the spring, as we have said. It will include a daily meeting or check-in with the teacher in order to build classroom community and to allow teachers to share their plans and expectations for each day. It will also have a greater emphasis on the use of live virtual instruction, especially at the elementary level on live small group instruction virtually. Teachers will also use pre-recorded videos and screencasts to provide direct instruction and assign independent work that builds on the learning taking place during live instruction. In this model, students will have access to all textbooks and learning materials that they would normally have in the classroom. At this time, Jennifer Shriver, our Executive Director for Secondary, will lead us through more of the details regarding virtual instruction. And we can move to the next slide, please. Good morning. Virtual instruction will look very different from the distance learning that we experienced in the spring. 
Specific criteria has been added by Senate Bill 98 to assure that student learning is our priority. We are working with our stakeholders to clearly define the expectations so all students will have access and support for high quality teaching and learning. This page illustrates some of the criteria that will be essential for student success. Attendance will be required to be taken daily for each student. Daily participation may include, but is not limited to, evidence of participation in online activities, completion of regular assignments, completion of assessments, and contacts between teachers and pupils or parents and guardians. Student learning and assessments will be graded in the virtual model. Unlike the spring when grades were held harmless, virtual learning will require a more traditional form of evaluation to provide feedback on learning for students and parents. Gradebooks, progress reports, and grades for transcripts will be a part of this process. Live instruction and interaction is a key component in, to support student learning. We are working with our staff to develop key professional learning to equip our teachers with the knowledge and skills needed to effectively connect with our students through this platform. Maintaining school connectedness is essential for student success. We recognize that different students have different instructional needs. Small group instruction and tutoring are a few samples of how we will be able to address specific needs. Staff will be working with our students and families to identify our students' personalized needs. Another effective strategy is hosting office hours. Staff will provide specific hours of availability to students and families. This provides a structure to access teachers for assistance. We are really excited to implement our new learning management system called Canvas. This system is widely used across California in many schools and universities. It has many possibilities to enhance learning and access for teachers, students, and families. Training will be forthcoming for our teachers, students, and families. Device connectivity will be required for virtual instruction. We are creating processes to provide students and families with devices and connectivity as needed. Further information will be provided in the upcoming weeks. We quickly realized in the spring the importance of training for everybody involved in the student's education. So we are currently planning specific student and parent training modules to assist with all the new information surrounding virtual learning. A parent and student agreement will be part of the onboarding process for the virtual program. This document will describe the expectations and conditions for participating in the program. And finally, based on student enrollment, we may need to assign students to a different site to accommodate for class sizes. Now, I would like to introduce our Executive Director of Special Education, Jana Preston, for our next slide regarding special instruction, uh, special education, excuse me. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Many of the educational components that were discussed today apply to students with disabilities and specialized programs. However, the provision of special education services and specialized instruction is a complex task. We have collected input of our, of our staff uh, from each of our sites and teams, and we continue refining components of the learning models so we can meet successfully the needs of our students with disabilities. We will provide a free appropriate public education to our students to the extent possible and will examine carefully and address their individual needs and creatively utilize the opportunities that each of the learning model offers. Specialized instruction and related services will be provided virtually and in, and in person whenever it is possible. We will be developing creative solutions to include our students so they have opportunities to be educated with their non-disabled peers in any model that is available. And we will pro uh, continue providing access to assistive technology as we have and offer training to our families and so to support the learning. If a virtual model is implemented that allows limited interactions with students, we will actively seek creative ways to provide specialized instruction virtually and in person while complying with the health and safety guidelines. Our executive directors of elementary and secondary education, Ms. Muchnik and Ms. Shriver will lead us through the next slide on the blended model. Ms. Diaz, would you please switch to the next slide? 
OK, now we're going to move on to the second model, which we are referring to as blended. Uh, this program will look different when it is by choice for elementary and secondary. At the elementary level, students who choose the blended model will be on campus two days a week and working at home three days a week. On campus days will tentatively be Tuesday, Thursday or Wednesday, Friday. Class size in this model for elementary will be 12 to 16 students per class when on campus. This allows for greater social distancing within the classroom. On campus days will also dismiss a little early to facilitate lunch at home, again for safety precautions. Secondary instruction in the blended model will work a little differently than elementary due to the way our schools are structured. Blended for secondary is a combination of virtual classes and in-person classes depending on a student's course request. For example, a student might request to take their core classes virtually, yet want to take a robotics class in person. This model allows student choice and access to all course offerings in the manner they choose. Unlike elementary, secondary classes will be traditional in size. And additionally, the number of in-person courses will determine the length of time a student spends on campus. In the event that the district that district wide we need to implement a model to minimize student contact contact secondary would follow a hybrid model that is very similar to the elementary blended model shared here a hybrid model would split the student population in half and have them attend on alternating days students would be on campus two days per week and learning from home the other three this would allow for smaller class sizes and less human contact because of the sheer size and course offerings at our secondary sites, our blended model is based on student or family choice, whereas the hybrid model would only occur if it was a district-wide decision to minimize student contact. Next slide, please. Like the virtual model, this slide describes a summary of some of the key components in the blended model. As you can see, this information is almost identical to the virtual model. One of the differences that you will notice that the office hours may be in person or virtual in a blended model. But overall, blended is very similar to the virtual model and the with the addition of on campus in person instruction sometimes. And now Faith will share a traditional model in the next slide. OK, so far we have shared information about the virtual model and the blended or hybrid model. We're now going to discuss the third and final model, which is traditional. As you look at the description on the screen, you'll see that most of the bullets are what you would expect to see. The traditional model meets in person five days a week with traditional class sizes and schedules. Grades and reporting are also traditional in nature, and this model will also include the use of our new learning management system, Canvas. We feel it is very important to build the capacity of all of our staff in using Canvas, regardless of the model that they are teaching, as it will be advantageous if we have to move to one of the models throughout the course of the year. And it also advances our instruction by, by aligning it with technology-based learning practices. In the traditional model this year, a few things will be adjusted. There will be a greater focus on individual supplies and materials for students, which will be a big change at the elementary level, but will occur in order to support student health and safety. Additionally, visitors and parent volunteer opportunities will be limited, also in an effort to create a safe campus environment. Lastly, there will be a number of additional safety and health modifications, which will be the topic of some of our upcoming slides. And now I would like to introduce the Director of Student Support, Dale Velk, for our next few slides on co-curricular programs and activities. You may go to the next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to provide you with the most recent update in regards to athletics and extracurricular activities. Athletics. As of right now, all athletics in the CIF Southern section have been shut down until further notice. This includes practices, workouts, trainings, scrimmages, summer camps, and even youth sports. CIF has been working with state and county officials and together 
that have made decisions for this upcoming year. This Monday, July 20th at 1 p.m. on YouTube, CIF will announce the high school sports calendar plan for all high schools in the entire state. The plan will outline when sports will begin for this upcoming school year. Our feeling is that with all the recent developments and the, the recent articles that we've been reading about in the press enterprise, that all athletics will be pushed back until later in the school year. I know today there was an article in today's paper talking about the possibility of starting some sports now, like golf or tennis, but the overall feeling that we have been getting, and that's our athletic directors and, and here at the district, is that all sports will be pushed back. And so we're just gonna have to just wait and see what CIF has decided when they make their announcement on Monday at one o'clock. And if you wanna tune in, uh, it's gonna be posted again on YouTube, and that is gonna be at CIFSS for Southern Section. So CIFSS. Moving on to performing arts. If school athletics are postponed due to the outbreak concerns in the current situation, that decision will affect performing arts programs such as band, choir, drama, and leadership programs like ASB. You know, just this last week, we saw that the Rose Parade was canceled. And so, you know, that's a big one. And so right now, the feeling from county health officials and state health officials is that it just isn't safe to have large crowds, either outdoor or indoor, and especially in places like auditoriums or gymnasiums or even at school stadiums. Uh, we were just informed just this past week that uh, band competitions and field shows all across the country have been canceled for this upcoming school year. So we just want everyone in the community to know that while the field shows and performances may be affected right now, it's important for everyone to understand that we will continue to offer those classes, the band, the choir, the drama, and the leadership this school year, just as we have in the past. Of course, you know, there we, we will have to, uh, modify those classes and follow the county health guidelines. Also, we want everyone to know that we will also continue these classes at the elementary schools, and those classes will either be conducted in person or through virtual learning, uh, depending on the decisions from the state and county health officials. Our goal as a district is to keep all of these programs up and running so that when restrictions are lifted, the programs can resume operations as quickly as allowable. So to recap real quick, all athletics in CIF Southern Section have been shut down until further notice. And again, this includes practices, workouts, training, scrimmages, summer camps, and youth sports. This Monday, July 20th, CIF will announce the 2020-2021 high school sports calendar to all high schools throughout the entire state. Our goal as a district is to keep all athletic and extracurricular programs up and running so that when restrictions are lifted, the programs can resume operations as quickly as possible. As we wait for the restrictions to be lifted, we will continue to follow all county and public health guidelines. This will allow us to provide the safest environment possible for our students, staff, and community. And our coaches and teachers, they will complete COVID-19 safety training prior to starting practices or camps. And those trainings are available right now to all our district employees through our online Keenan safety trainings. Also at this time, all field trips for sports or extracurricular activities have been canceled, and we are asking these groups to schedule virtual field trips, virtual competitions or virtual trainings uh, in place of live events. <clears throat> and with the start of the school year coming, at this time, all assemblies, dances, and pep rallies, basically any activity that has, may have a large crowd gathering, have also been canceled until further notice. Thank you, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mrs. Mary Walters. Thank you. Next slide, please. To accommodate this ever-changing situation, we're, we're uh, talking about registration next steps. We plan to open registration for blended and virtual learning on July 20th. We also plan to send out a communication with a link for, to a form for parents to register their student for their preferred virtual blended learning model. If Governor Newsom makes an announcement today about how schools will be opening, that may change our registration process and we will communicate directly with all of our stakeholders. 
Additionally, parents will be able to begin completion of annual registration documents through our Aries Parent Portal beginning on July 27th. School levels, elementary, middle, and high um, are planning their school orientations, as always. Schools will be sending out their communications and plans for orientation before school be begins, no matter what model we will open with. Our first day of school is planned for August 14th and we look forward to, to the beginning of the 2020-21 school year. With that, uh, board members, uh, do you have any questions for any of us on the Ed Services team? Yes, Mrs. Walters, thank you so much. Um, I would like to circle back to SB 98 and the question of average daily attendance, ADA. Um, if you want to talk about that a little bit, or if or I can go ahead and talk about it a little bit. I've been attending a lot of meetings, virtual meetings, all summer long, so I have a little bit of knowledge about that. To uh, just discuss briefly, and if you want to add, um, uh, President Lunn, uh, all students are required to attend school, and if they do not attend or participate in um, instruction, no matter what model, um, that will um, be uh, an absence for them. And so we are required to take daily attendance and follow up on students who are not attending on a daily basis. So is there um, further information that you would like to share? Um, yes, actually, my understanding, and um, Mr. Kelly, please jump in if you um, if I need to be corrected. My understanding is that yes, we do have to take daily attendance, um, no matter what model is being used, but that our average daily attendance will not be being reported back to the state and will not affect our funding. That in fact, our state funding will be based on 2019-2020 ADA numbers. So um, a number of parents have been very concerned asking if a child gets sick and is out for two weeks, does that affect our funding? And the answer to that then would be no. That, that is correct. Let me, let me provide a little bit of uh, clarification uh, uh, with that. Um, the funding level for the district um, is guaranteed through SB 98 to not dip below what our levels were for the last school year. There is a component um, that the legislature and the governor will likely be undertaking at some point in the future. What it doesn't do is if that ADA increases districts who experience growth at this time, there is not an affording uh, for those those growth dollars that would that would be needed. But that is expected to be to be undertaken. But I think the bigger picture of what you're talking about is absolutely correct. In the past four or five years, we have put tremendous focus onto student attendance. When students are in school, they learn. When students aren't in school, they don't learn. The focus for that for the district as well as the state is greatly changing in a pandemic environment. When people are not feeling well, they should not come to school and there should there is not a um, a consequence for that with uh, with an illness or not feeling well. And uh, Thank you so Mr. Much. Kelly, this is Bill Lee. May I just clarify one particular point? There is still this is Bill Lee. Uh, there is still a requirement to take the attendance and to report it uh, as normal. So even though the potential financial impacts are not there, the requirement is still there to take the attendance and report it to the state. Thank you That's so much, lot. Mr. Olin, Mr. Kelly, for um, clarifying that. And I think we have another comment. This is um, Mr. Diffley asking a question. Uh, when you're taking role, uh, somebody who is at home, how do you know if they leave the room or fall asleep or what have you? Uh, what what goes on at that point? Is the, I assume the role is taken at the beginning of the class. Is that also taken at the end? Mr. Diffley, uh, the students, yeah, they they uh, do a they have 
daily live interaction that is required and also assignments that they need to do as well. So they'll teachers will be able to follow up on on whether they're participating in the live interaction on a daily basis as well as the assignments. That's great. That's great. Thank you. All right. Um, other board members, do you have comments on the content so far? Yes, uh, this is uh, Mrs. Tomasian, and I do have some questions, several questions. Um, first one, if a family has more than one uh, child, but only one computer at home, uh, will we be able to provide extra um, computers for the rest of the children in the family? This is Mary. Uh, I can answer that question. Our plan is to provide devices for each of the students so they can participate in the learning in a virtual environment. Oh, that'll be great. Thank you. And then um, you mentioned an agreement that parents need to sign. Um, could you talk a little bit of more, more about that? And, and also, what if parents don't sign an agreement? I'd, I'd like to know what the agreement says and, and uh, consequences of not signing. So Ms. Tomasin, we're working on that agreement. Let me um, see if Faith and Jennifer can add a little bit more information. I, I can. Is, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Jen. Sorry. Um, this is something that we currently use in our independent study program, something similar to it. So whenever we release a student to work independently, we need to make sure that there are certain criteria so that we make sure the kid stays on track. So that's what this um, agreement will encompass is just some kind of a, the, the rules that you need to participate, that you need to actually complete work. Because the last thing we want is a kid to sign up for um, virtual and then they kind of disappear and we, we, we're not maintaining that connectedness. So there will be a, um, so to speak, a pyramid of intervention. And part of AB 98 states that if a student is absent more than 60% of a week, then we need to make sure that we are going back and um, doing something about it. And so that's what we're working on right now is what will that look like? Is it a phone call home? Exactly what that process will be. And so that will all be encompassed in this agreement. Um, so this is kind of a past practice that we've always done with independent study, but this will be a little different because the nature of virtual is different than the traditional independent study program. And Mrs. Tomasi, and if I could clarify as well, this parent agreement that you that was presented today is under the context of this would be the program choice that the parent would be selecting if conditions are such with the governor's announcement that we all default to a particular model uh, that will probably have to be rethought okay great okay thank you i have a couple more questions if that's okay um this one, I'm uh, curious about uh, physical education. Um, how will that be uh, taught? What sort of activities uh, will uh, the students participate in? Also, um, I'm wondering about credit uh, for band and JROTC students. They typically receive uh, PE credit uh, for the marching band and uh, JROTC. So I'm wondering how that will be addressed. Mrs. Tomasian, this is Mrs. Lund, and I think I can answer some of that, um, certainly with support from the rest of staff. Again, SB 98, my understanding is that that waives the PE minutes requirements. It doesn't stop us, stop teachers from teaching some form of, uh, of physical education, but the requirement for the number of minutes has been waived. Is that correct? That is correct, um, and you know we will have to modify what PE looks like if we go back. Well, in any of the models, but we will still be offering those courses as we um, said, and the JRTC and marching band will still get the PE credit. And if if I can just add, this is Jen. Um, if I can just add, also we have done PE courses in an independent study form in the past. And so again, these are not new concepts for some of our teachers. And so we will just be working together to make sure that we fine tune it and it's much more detailed for our families. Okay, so if I'm understanding um, that it means without participation, the students will receive the PE credit. 
Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. One more question, and then I'll be done. And and you, this is a tough one. If masks are required, what do what happens with students who remove their masks? And I'm thinking particularly um, the youngest students. Uh, this might be really difficult to have them keep their masks on. And and actually, any grade, we may have some defiant students, <laughs> you know, who who take their masks off. Will there be um, uh, what kind of uh, process will follow if that occurs? Well, uh, Ms. Tomasian, that has been a topic of conversation. I think um, everyone understands the importance of wearing the mask. Um, and so we are going to have to do a lot of education with our families and our students and our staff. And um, we are talking about what will the procedures be if if students do not wear masks. So we're working on that on that process right now. I thank you. I, I think that's probably one of the most difficult uh, areas that we have to address. So thank you all for your answers. I appreciate it. Mr. Diffley has a question. Um, just to, actually, it's clarification. I have in my district, which is District 5, a couple of families. Uh, one of which has eight children and the other one has 12. Uh, and I get, do I interpret correctly that each of those kids who are school age will have uh, their own computer? Bill, do you want to answer that question? Yes, this is Bill Oline. Uh, we, and in my section, I'll, I'll describe a little bit more about extra devices we have ordered. So uh, during the springtime, uh, many families uh, chose to use devices at home and many families chose to use devices provided by the district. During that time, it tended to be one per family, uh, but what we've done with the extra devices that we've ordered is for families that request and need more uh, either device for their family for one child or for more than one child, uh, we can provide those for those families that request that. That's great, thank you. I have a... Uh question or I'd like to confirm something I think I know uh, from what I've learned uh, around the region, around the state uh, or in the county for sure. Um, it has to do with technology connectivity. My understanding is that our district is ahead of that and that uh, whatever devices our students will need, there, there will not be uh, difficult issues of connectivity for that particular residence. Uh, is that uh, an accurate portrayal of where we are with regard to technology connectivity issues? Thank you. Uh, yes, this is Bill Olin, if I may jump in and answer that question, certainly from our experience during the springtime. Um, in general, uh, the answer is yes to your question that there are, our community does have a lot of access to broadband in a lot of areas of our community. However, we do need to be aware of those families that are either in remote areas or, or due to financial situations are unable to afford it. Um, so working on plans uh, for hotspot devices, which we did uh, pass out for those particular families, and we will continue to do so working with those families individually on a case-by-case -case basis. So you're right, on a general basis, that is true, connectivity is there, but we will have to work with individual families for situations due to financial or remote access where it may not be possible. Okay, and Mr. Rivas, we haven't heard from you if you have some comments on the presentation so far. Uh, no, no comments and no questions at uh, this time. They were answered throughout the presentation. Um, I think for me, I am listening to all voices and um, all information uh, just to be aware and then looking at some things myself. But um, thank you for sharing the information. I, at this time, I don't have any questions. I might have some as time goes on, but uh, right now I do not. All right, so we can um, move on to Mr. Olin and the business and operations section, and then we can wrap up with again board member comment and questions at the end of that. So Mr. Olin, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. As stated before, my name is Bill Olin, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Business and Operations. If you could go to the next slide, please. One of the big focus areas, obviously, as is everywhere, is cleaning and disinfecting. 
Uh, we are currently during the summer doing thorough and deep cleaning of all of our school sites in addition to disinfecting all of our surfaces. These photos illustrate some of the cleaning efforts and the variety of cleaning efforts that are going on, as I said, as well as disinfecting all surfaces. In addition, um, even after all this is done, our plan is to do one more disinfecting of all of our schools uh, before students would, or staff uh, or students that would arrive. When students do ever come back on campus, our plan for the nighttime is enhanced cleaning and disinfecting at all our schools, including all desks and high touch surface areas. So we can thoroughly before each day starts, we have cleaned and disinfected all surfaces before each school day starts. During the day, if students are on campus, the plan is to clean and disinfect frequently touched areas throughout the day, including things such as restrooms, uh, doorknobs, uh, desk surface and other high test touch surface areas. We have installed and are still continuing to install hundreds of hand sanitizers through all our schools, including various areas of high traffic areas. In addition, we're going to be placing portable hand washing stations at all of our schools. Next slide, please. This, this photo illustrates the placement of hand sanitizers in various areas. Of course, there will be hand sanitizing stations in every classroom, but as well in all sorts of different areas of high traffic areas, such as door exit areas, entrances, or other high touch areas where there's a larger crowd pro providing an opportunity for hand sanitizing in those areas. Next slide, please. This is a photo of the portable hand, sanit uh, portable hand washing stations that will be placed at all of our schools. Um, you've probably seen these before, probably encountered them before. You use your foot to pump the water out. There's soap and paper towels. And again, these will be placed at uh, all of our schools in areas, uh, for example, uh, perhaps by a playground area where either is hand, the hand sanitizing station or a restroom may not be as close by. This will provide an additional area to wash hands in those particular high traffic areas. Next slide, please. For our air conditioning and air, air conditioning and HVAC systems, um, certainly you've heard much about this. We have gone through all of our HVAC systems. We've checked, we've cleaned, we've maintained, and we've changed all of our filter systems uh, at all the schools. We have a review the recommendations from the air Fil National Air Filtration Association for the type of filters that will work best, and we continue to stay in touch with them for any uh, changes or updates as they recommend those systems. As well, all of your HVAC systems will have fresh uncirculated air into classrooms. Um, that is being based upon recommendations from the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning, ASHRAE, who is the national uh, standards board for air conditioning standards uh, that the federal government and most agencies will use to develop those standards. And we continue to follow those standards and recommendations for those systems. Next slide, please. In the classrooms, um, you know, one of the obviously big things is, is social distancing and physical distancing. Um, one of the things we're going to have to do is remove furniture uh, from classrooms to allow more space uh, into physically distanced students. Um, we'll have to set up desks to be as physically distanced as possible. Um, and I this photo here in the top, which shows this desk, this is from an elementary school classroom. You can see it looks pretty stark uh, because a lot of items have been removed from the, the classroom. You can see the desks uh, being separated. Another reason to illustrate this photo, this is uh, a, a scenario that's a good scenario. There are many classrooms due to furniture or physical layout of the classroom where the particular spacing is not as physically possible just due to the nature of the room or the type of furniture. So each classroom and, and, and site will vary a little bit. As illustrated, as you can see, there is hand sanitizer in each classroom. In the photo below the desk, you can see there's a every classroom, every desk, a teacher's desk will have a protective shield at the teacher's desk. A mask will be available in every classroom uh, if a student or staff member forgot their classroom. You can see an illustration there on the right photo of a bottle of disinfectant, which does not require PPE uh, to be sprayed. That can be used for all high touch surface areas during the day in the classroom. In addition, we will have special disinfectant in all classrooms that is face safe for electronics and computers. Many classrooms, uh, part of the curriculum requires the use of devices in a classroom. And as such, you know, if those exchange between students or between periods, this particular disinfectant can be safely used to disinfect 
uh, and as well as not harm the electronics. Next slide, please. We've uh, ordered and uh, have a lot of PPE for teachers, staff, and students, and, and we also have more coming as well. Uh, we have 3,000 washable face coverings. We currently have 100,000 uh, plus for adult sizes, 100,000 for children disposable masks as well. We have 3,000 plastic face shields and we have gloves as well. And there are additional PPE that we continue to order and we'll continue to order additional PPE as conditions changed and as as the as ordered by uh, health officials. Next slide, please. We in addition have, in, have placed uh, and are in the process of placing in all school offices and high traffic areas uh, where there is interactions with members or high traffic uh, individuals. Uh, the protective shields, similar to what you saw in a previous photo for the classrooms. Uh, we have installed 300 in offices, and as mentioned before, all classrooms, 1,000 classrooms, will also have these protective shields installed as well. And they are portable, as you can kind of see illustrated there from that, so they can, they do not require any sort of maintenance work to install them. They can be moved around if there's slight movement or some cases variation that might be needed to where they need to be placed. Next slide, please. A uh, question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, this is Mr. Diffley asking a question. Um, two parts to it. Uh, what happens on elementary schools uh, areas where there are balls during kickballs and things of that sort, and and uh, you know different classes use them. That's one first part. And the second part of the question is what happens when there's a change from one class to another. And uh, do the do the doorways and the student desktops get get uh, uh, disinfected in that f five or ten minute period, or or how's that going to work? Yes, uh, I will ask Mrs. Faith Munchnik in, in a second here to address the first question regarding recess, if I may. For sure. the for the second question regarding uh, between periods, we are we continue to have discussions with uh, our associations regarding uh, that topic. Um, and um, in terms of how we will do that, uh, the actual disinfecting, as I mentioned, will have will have plenty of disinfectant in all classrooms um, for those areas, including the doorknobs and uh, those areas and high touch areas as well. A desk. Um, it is a pretty quick process. The disinfectant, as I mentioned, is a time based oil a disinfectant. It does not require PPE. Uh, it's about a minute uh, to spray those surfaces within a classroom. It's, it is four minutes to uh, completely kill anything, <laughs> disinfect, you know, uh, SARS, MRSA, all the different kind of things, including COVID. And it merely needs to air dry. And we did a test in a couple of different classrooms within five minutes, uh, even uh, when it's air dried as well, it did kill those topics. And so we're trying to structure, figure it out during periods, how that might occur and making sure we have enough time to do that between periods. And so that is what we're working on. Um, Mrs. Muchnick, may I call upon you to discuss recess? Uh, yes, um, Mr. Diffley, it's a really good question. It's something our elementary logistics task force is looking at. I had mentioned earlier that we've started the conversation primarily around instructional materials and um, especially for our little kids. We often share supplies and such in classrooms and we've already made some decisions about how we can address individual um, supplies and, and be real, real careful about that. Recess, we haven't come to any absolutes yet. There's a couple um, different ways that we can look at it. Um, uh, looking at classroom and, and balls and, and materials that, that belong to individual classrooms that kids can use would at least um, take care of that. But we also have a lot of um, aid support that can help us in cleaning between recesses as well. So we're still exploring it. We know it's an area um, as, as well as the playground equipment and, and looking at you know all of the, the high touch areas that occur during recess. But we will be exploring it and putting guidance in place for our elementary schools and elementary principals are part of those discussions. Great, would, that helps a lot. Thank you. And I would just kind of add on to that, Mr. Diffley, that um, part of what we haven't necessarily announced here, but in terms of our day plan, will be pretty pretty thorough, which will include extra resources. Mrs. Muchnick mentioned uh, playgrounds, ensuring that we, for example, how we can disinfect 
uh, between uh, recess times for playgrounds. Um, so we will have extra resources and a more definitive directive plan for cleaning during the day. Does that answer your question, Mr. Diffley? It really does very thoroughly. Thank you both. I'd like to make a comment at, at this point, uh, just as a reminder to everyone. I'm so very proud of the uh, efforts undertaken by staff, but um, the, this item is titled mitigation efforts. Um, there's there's uh, never 100% um, assuredness uh, that everything is going to be perfect. Um, so these are reasonable uh, mitigation efforts. We'll take, if we go back to one of the slides, that Mr. Olin was sharing hand washing stations. You know, that's so a, a child who picks up a, uh, a ball, uh, they're going to be encouraged uh, to wash hands uh, afterwards. Those are the types of things that are just the constant types of habits that uh, are important for everyone in our society to instill in order to help this uh, this situation. But it's important to, to know uh, these are these are mitigate reasonable mitigation efforts. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, that is important. And I think you notice that, uh, for example, in this slide where, you know, we certainly encourage uh, and will have, you know, ways to be able to remind individuals to do those things, including washing hands and certainly having hand sanitizer and portable washing stations. But we have to expect people to do that. And so, you know, these will be signages we'll continue to see that are age appropriate, that'll be out at all sorts of campuses, A frames in front of the schools, signs placed in classrooms, signs placed in high traffic area, uh, signage e e on the ground, for example, or on the walls as appropriate there, including things that are directional nature and, and one way. And I think you'll notice this, and I think Mr. Kelly illustrated it. You know, if you've gone to the grocery store, these are the kind of things you see, except you'll see a lot more of this in our schools. Um, but then again, you have if we've you know, we've all been to grocery stores and some, you know, not everyone will obey that one way sign and the, the grocery store line. So, um, you know, we can put those signs up there. We can encourage and we can educate. But the reality is uh, to be able to police that will be in, in not not possible necessarily. But it is our job to make sure we educate and continue to have this message continue to be out there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> yes, regarding technology, I think we already kind of answered. We have already uh, ordered and have on hand an additional 3,000 devices compared to what we had in the spring. Those are ordered, they're delivered. You can see this is this kind of pallets of, of these devices and they're ready to go, uh, either for the virtual needs that are out there or their on-site needs. And so we just have a bunch of other new uh, laptops that are ready to go. Next slide, please. A couple extra uh, points regarding technology. First is that we have done a major expansion of our outdoor wireless system in anticipation of uh, increased need. This could be, for example, um, if, the, if the need exists or the desire exists to have instructional or other activities outside that require technology, we can handle a large amount of technology access uh, outside of our campuses. We have currently installing and finishing installing a new bells and paging system at, at our school sites. This is something we were in the process of at several sites, uh, primarily because of our aging bells and paging system. But we've accelerated that to include now all of our schools before the students return. Uh, it provides a lot of safety and security improved measures. But as an example, one thing it can do is play uh, regularly pre-recorded messages on hand washing and safety. Um, so the idea is you have the signage for visual and audio, uh, visual. You'll have uh, messages perhaps being played at, at appropriate times uh, that can uh, assist with auditory uh, people as well who want to listen. So the idea is to continue to reinforce messages in various methods about safety and hand washing. Next slide, please. For serving food, uh, the left Column, left column over there, you, you will see uh, a picture of students' faces. Um, we're, the objective here is to be able to have uh, no touch for students to receive meals. Um, here's an ex illustration of example of a operator who might be uh, serving the meal to the student. You can see the picture and press the picture uh, to that so the student will, does not have to touch anything like entering their number. For secondary students, you can see an example, they get to scan their ID card uh, with a scanner. Uh, as, as well as secondary sites, we're looking at uh, increasing the amount of those mobile storage carts in order to provide more access areas 
to be able to get meals and meals we prepackaged individually wrapped. Uh, next slide, please. And for meal service in our cafeterias and otherwise, we'll have social distancing signage, again, to remind uh, students to be able to maintain that distancing. We will limit service, but for every other window, there will be no self-service stations such as salad bars. Of course, all personnel will wear the appropriate PPE and hand sanitizers will be available. We will do even more enhanced cleaning and sanitizing measures. Again, our nutrition service staff are pretty used to this. This is kind of a standard procedure due to food and health regulations, but we're going to we're actually going to ramp that up even more. Uh, as mentioned before, foods will be surface uh, packaged and prepackaged surf packaged food. Also, you know, as I mentioned before, the everything will be kind of uh, touchless for students and elementary students can receive a backpack tag to be used for that kind of meal pickup. Next slide, please. For transportation, um, it is a difficult and I think Mr. Kelly again mentioned it very well. Here's a great example and I know I've mentioned this to the board previously. We have about 50 buses. Uh, if we were to follow all those kind of guidelines regarding distancing as an example, we would need 200 buses. So we are not able to accommodate uh, on our buses fully all those guidelines. However, we can do every mitigation measure that we're able to do, such as limiting the amount of students that we have per seat. Uh, we will um, sanitize all our buses between the morning and afternoon routes. Additional time will be built into the schedules to ensure that we can sanitize the bus between those routes. Installing hand sanitizers as illustrated here. Uh, PPE and masks for the bus riders and the staff. And signage throughout the bus to remind uh, about the safety and the distancing. And we'll also increase the staff to allow for those larger bus stops to be able to provide that spacing and distancing and providing more online access and for pre registration for the riders. Next slide, please. I did kind of want to illustrate that we now we are just relying on ourselves, but we did in, uh, rely on an outside safety expert to look at our plans and review. He came out to our classrooms and reviewed with us some of the things that we're doing not only in terms of classroom physical layouts, but the cleaning and disinfecting procedures and some of the other things. And so I did kind of want to read his quote. Um, the efforts being made by Mira Valley Unified School District to welcome back staff and students to the respective campuses in a safe manner should be applauded. From the paging system to sanitation stations, proposed desk wipe downs, classroom layouts and everything in between to be within health guidelines being set forth for the opening schools. There's a lot of attention to detail that may not be initial seen from the casual observer. I really want to illustrate that, uh, point out that quote because uh, hopefully it shows that we have been involved with a ton of details that I couldn't even illustrate here. We'd be here for hours and hours going over all the details, but just to illustrate that uh, we wanted to have an outside safety expert ensuring that at least we're pointed in the right path uh, towards this difficult test. Next slide, I believe that is our end and I have uh, that yes so i any questions for business and operations okay um yes actually i would like to go ahead and start with um, board member comments on all this and i'd like to go ahead and lead that off this is linda lunn um i first of all would like to go back just a little bit and i just want to thank everybody who put in a public comment or sent a letter to myself or to the whole board or to mr kelly um i really appreciate all of the information that you brought to the table for us. Um, I tried to respond to as many people as possible who wrote me emails and I just got completely overwhelmed yesterday um, just with the sheer numbers and couldn't um, couldn't respond to everybody personally. Please don't take that personally. Um, and I hope you always feel comfortable contacting me to let me know where you stand on the issues because I do appreciate your feedback. And I'm also especially thankful for all the phone conversations that I have had this past week, which were incredibly informative to me and brought up a lot of valuable ideas and questions. So thank you to everyone. Um, it seemed like your communications were heartfelt and they were such a good reminder to all of us that the physical health, the mental health, the economic health, and the academic health of all of our staff and students are so important and they all play an important part of this big puzzle, the puzzle Mr. Kelly mentioned. Um, thank you to so many of the communicators that acknowledged that our this situation, this pandemic situation makes it nearly impossible to meet the 
every need of every individual. Um, we need to keep in mind that we have 23,268 projected students enrolled for this year and 2,000 employees. And by extension, everyone in every one of those households. So this is, this is a big, big deal here. And there's no magic solution that works for everybody right now in each family. In fact, every student has a unique story and has unique needs. I would like to um, offer as well to remember that whatever um, approach we end up taking, whether it's dictated by the state or it's a parent choice, whatever model comes out, it's probably not forever. It will be a period of weeks or months that we have to follow whatever model we end up following. We need to work on getting students back in classrooms just as soon as possible when we can do it safely, especially for those who need it most. The populations I'm talking about are students and families who receive special ed services, Title I services, counseling services, nutrition services, and the IT and connectivity services that we can provide as a district. We need to get those students back on campus as soon as we can within safety provisions. Doing that, of course, would mean that we need site on staff, or I'm sorry, staff on sites from the very beginning so that individuals and then perhaps small groups could begin to receive educational services through office hours, computer labs. Um, we mentioned that some of the connectivity issues are that um, students live in areas that have no connectivity. Maybe we could bus some of those. It's a limited number of people. I understand this. Busing some of those kids in to computer labs to be able to do some of their work. Um, and finally, whatever we do, I am directing staff that it must be assessed on a regular basis, um, I think monthly. So if we start on August 14th, September, middle of September, we're reassessing, middle of October, and so forth and so on, as long as it takes until we can really safely educate all of our students. I'm really starting to look to and hear from so many people about the lack of daycare options. And providing daycare is the same, would have the same complications as providing a traditional classroom. I understand that. But could we begin to try to study or investigate how we could provide, however limited, and only for people truly in need, but some forms of daycare if we have to go to some sort of a blended or virtual model of, of learning. I'd like to look into that as a district. Mrs. Lund, and, um, I uh, very much uh, the things that you've mentioned, we've been writing these things down and uh, we will absolutely do more research and create plans that could answer these needs. Okay, well, if it'll help, I have it all written down too. I can email it to you. Okay. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, so going forward, you guys, I get it. None of this is comfortable. None of it. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a parent of two children enrolled in our school district. My husband and I are struggling with all of the same issues that all of the rest of you are struggling with as well. Our economic health, our physical health, our, the mental health of our children and of ourselves, um, and also their academic health. How are we going to provide you know, our robust educational opportunities for our children this fall and into the next year? Um, whatever decisions that are made in the coming weeks, I am so proud of our staff for working all summer to be able to have three very good, distinct models ready to go, traditional, blended, or virtual, we can pretty much drop into that. And I'm very happy about that. Um, finally, on public comment, you guys know that we're not allowed legally to respond to it. However, we can thank people. And if you've read the public comments or when you're able to read the public comments, 
I'd like to do one little shout out and it's to Bruce. Bruce, you rock. Your words um, made my heart sing this morning because you spoke from your heart and I want to thank you for that. And I hope that you always keep speaking up and speaking out and continue thinking about all of the issues from all the angles. I really appreciate you. And with that, I will go to um, Mr. Dixon. Do you have comments or questions on the presentation that we have just seen? Well, the complexity of what uh, we as a culture have had to deal with and how we've dealt with it this last seven, eight months uh, is enormous. I think that uh, school districts have been put right at the middle of the uh, uh, challenges to address all of the various interests uh, for now. And, and we're evaluating this. It's a moving target. We all know that. My own guess is that uh, it will continue to be a pretty muddled picture at least for four more months. Uh, but the uh, it doesn't really address what I really want to say and is that the extraordinary efforts that have been uh, expended especially by the administrative staff but all all of the stakeholders in this district uh, can make us proud. Um, we all have individual perspectives of cost benefit analysis and needs and and defining safety is always uh, I tried to tack jello to a wall um, in a society that values um, individual freedom and choice um, there needs to be some grace and tolerance uh, and certainly respect for others opinions but the uh, Herculean efforts, I would use that term, of our staff, sacrificial efforts, by comparison to uh, so many uh, members of our society, uh, needs to be recognized. And uh, for, uh, starting with the superintendent, the key staff, down to uh, everyone who cares about the upcoming generation um, and what the world is going to look like to them, not just in the next you know, several months, but uh, for the future, that's that's where our heart is. That's what we are endeavoring to uh, make good decisions on. Um, the best decision I think made so far is the, and I'll use the word again, extraordinary efforts on behalf of our, our key staff in trying to balance all of these things. Uh, uh, very, feel very privileged to be, or have been, and and still be uh, going a part of this school district is uh, is is, uh, is a highlight. So, uh, Pat, to you and your staff, and all the way down the chain, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I do thank the uh, participants uh, that uh, are, you know, uh, sharing <laughs> their concerns. That helps to instruct us all. And uh, uh, certainly, I'm glad to have the vehicles. Uh, that we do have in this day and age to have those um, not just shared but maybe amplified. So I look forward to the process uh, again with great appreciation uh, uh, for what has been done to provide us with information and, and uh, intelligent choices uh, on difficult issues. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dipley, would you like to go next? Yes, thanks. Um, to everyone who made the presentation today, um, I wish this these presentations could have been made to every citizen in Murrieta, frankly. Um, when I look at the tremendous amount of work that has gone into every aspect of cleanliness and teaching and so forth, I honestly think that uh, we could uh, sell this to about three quarters of the school districts in the United States. It's so complete. Uh, I want to mention the fact that um, in the midst of all this, there are moms and dads trying to keep home and families together. Uh, 
people, both people working, um, concerned, and anything that we can do to help them um, in any small way to keep their families together uh, is worth every minute. Um, and lastly, perfection. Um, the plans that uh, I have heard about and that you have developed are reaching towards perfection, and I appreciate it. None of us are perfect, and you'll find that there are some small things that need to be adjusted, but uh, everyone is to be commended for the effort and love that they have put into these programs, and um, I, for one, really appreciate it, and thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Dipley. Mrs. Tomasian. Thank you. First, I would like to thank staff for all the hard work in designing the three learning models. I would like to also thank everyone who wrote to me or sent in public comments. It is grateful to know that so many care about our students' education. I know we all want to return to the pre-COVID days of education. Our district provided a phenomenal education for our students back then. We were even recognized as a California exemplary district by the state of California. In spring, distance learning was required overnight. Teachers, staff, students, and families struggled. This summer, as we heard in the presentation, our teachers and staff have been working hard to develop three exceptional learning op options for our students. I am glad that parent training and support, as mentioned in the presentation, is to be provided. As a strong supporter of parent rights, I was pleased that the district initially offered three different learning models for families to choose from. The current conditions, however, warrant a closer look at the district priorities and how they impact the various learning options. I believe that safety is a vital component, component of providing an outstanding education for our students. We have worked hard over the years to ensure student and staff safety. Now we are faced with a virus that threatens our safety. We must look to the experts to guide us. We are experts in education, not viruses. Over the past several months, I have listened to the health experts give advice only to have the advice change the next week as more studies are completed and more information is known. I would like to see our district be open to change also as more information is gained about COVID. I believe we need to listen to the health and safety recommendations and mandates from the state and county health experts. The health and safety of our student and staff is essential. We should look at the long-term plan for our students as we work through the COVID pandemic. We saw how disruptive switching to distance learning overnight was. Right now, there is overwhelming data to show a tremendous increase in cases in our community. The health and safety experts are telling us to wear masks, stay away from each other, and restaurants, gyms, and movie theaters are now closed again. I would like to see the district open cautiously, but look to expand options as the data allows. Perhaps data, health recommendations, and mandates could be examined every month or six-week grading period to see if we can modify our learning models. Lastly, I know from reading close to 200 emails regarding the opening of schools that parents, staff, and the community are divided about the best course of action. Whatever our decision is, many will be unhappy. I have a huge favor to ask of all parents. Please make every effort to not make negative comments in front of your children about the way school will open. Children learn best in a positive environment. Please help your child's education by supporting them and being excited and optimistic about this school year. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Tomasian. Mr. Rivas. Oh, yes, thank you. I, um, I feel the same as, as some of the comments that have been shared. Um, I guess at this time, just grateful for the opportunity to be able to hear all the voices um, through email, through the comments, and from uh, members of 
of the team that have provided the information regarding the the three models and, and other pieces of information. I um, I'm listening to the information with an open mind um, and uh, with an open heart. I would like to say that um, I think this is a process where we're going to learn a lot from on both ends. Um, I, I also believe that we are going to make some really great and good decisions. And I think in most people's, I guess, experience that sometimes this is, doesn't happen often or maybe it does, but I tend to do it regularly. I also know we're going to make bad decisions. I can admit when I'm wrong, I can admit when I'm right. And I see this as an opportunity and a process uh, to learn not only as an individual, but a, as a community, which is um, which is very important as we're, as we're all hearing from each other. I am going to base a lot of what I feel on a value and principle that I believe in that has changed my life, which is uh, the principle of growth. And um, I feel that at the end, growth is what is going to be important to remember in this process. And um, like some comments have been made, I, I do believe that whatever we decide to do, uh, whether we go 100% online or the other forms um, as the models were presented, I, I, I believe that we're going to be able to overcome whatever obstacle comes in the way as we work together. I, um, I am grateful for the comments that were made regarding the, the science and all that information. I happen to work in allied health. Uh, for those of you that don't know, I've, I've worked for quite some bit in allied health and I became an educator in allied health. Uh, and I've been that for several years. I currently teach a blended program where uh, we're online and then we're in person. Um, being able to be in an environment where I am able to teach students, adult students, out of, um, you know, give injections, draw blood, and be around an environment where this virus is, um, is just giving us difference of opinions. I can comfortably say that being in that environment gives me a perspective of understanding of the concerns that people have. I, I have children in the district, one at each level, one in elementary, one in middle school, and one in um, high school. I have that perspective as well. I'm a widower, single father. So I have the perspective of the challenges that uh, some individuals are going. I know there are many other situations and scenarios that other people are going through that I have no exposure to. And that is why I feel very strongly that when, when I hear the voice of, let's go back, we need it, and that's the right thing to do. And I hear the voice of, let's not go back, let's be more cautious, that is what we need right now as complex and maybe contradicting as this sounds, you're both right. We are going to have unintended consequences in either situation. And so I ask, you know, parents and, and teachers uh, to understand, be patient, and to consider that um, whatever we do go through as a community, we are going to learn together. And I know there's going to be strong feelings either way. I wanted to share a quote um, with everyone. Uh, as I think of as, as we move forward, but this is, a, this is a quote that I actually received this, this morning. And it says, um, there is no end to education. It is not that you read a book, pass an examination, and finish with education. The whole of life from the moment you are born to the moment you die is a process of learning. And I truly believe that having the opinions that we have are great, 
I think they're extremely important to share, which I'm grateful for, for all those that have, like I said, shared already and those that will continue to share. But I get the sense that as time goes on in this learning process, the, the learning is never going to end. It's always going to continue. We're going to figure it out one way or another. I trust that as human beings, we have the level of care and respectfulness for each other that we support as much as possible working together to be able to navigate through this thing. Because there is no correct and clear answer at this time. We have some ideas for some things, but I believe that there are some things that are unknown. I love the idea of learning and growth. And that happens inside of the classroom, outside of the classroom, in the home, and outside of the home. I don't believe this is the end of anything that we can't overcome. I truly believe that as I think of history and what is echoed in the hallways of history, that we were designed to overcome and to not live in constant friction and fear of what may be. And so I'm fully confident that as we work together, as we continue to share, that we will come out over and over again um, in, in learning and growth experiences. But I'm truly grateful for everyone that has shared all the information they have shared and um, just looking forward to continued information. Uh, the only thought that I've had to the models as far as how they were presented was uh, possibly some research or consideration of uh, schedules as far as students maybe coming on different days, morning and then afternoon students, that kind of idea. Um, maybe it has been looked into, maybe not, but that's the only thought that I have that um, may be helpful, even if it doesn't happen now. Again, these are conversations, but at some point we're going to get back on on ground. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rivas. This is Linda Lunn again. I do have one quick sort of technical question, um, and maybe it was answered and I missed it. I don't think so. What, um, Mrs. Walters, what considerations are being taken into account for our English language learners? And um, if we were to go to a virtual or blended, um, would they have support systems for that? Absolutely, with all of our students um, with their programs, whether it's um, students with disabilities, English learners, our foster youth, our homeless youth, there will be supports for those students, whether it's virtual or um, in person in small groups. Thank you so much. Um, in closing, Mr. Rivas, Thank you. Um, your words are just absolutely inspirational. And truly, I'd really like to speak to everybody right now. We are Americans. And what makes America great is that we always overcome stuff. We've been through great, great disasters throughout our history. And every single time we pull together, we band together, and we make it work, no matter what's going on. And I truly believe, especially here in Marietta, that we have the ability to do that. Um, Mrs. Tomasian, your words about role modeling, positive, can-do, persevering behaviors for our children makes a huge difference. And I would implore all parents to really talk to their children about, you can do this. Whatever comes down the road, whatever decisions are made in the coming weeks, children, students, you've got this. You can do this. We're going to get you any help that you need. And finally, as an overall sort of community message, I would implore everyone to remember that all of us have unique needs. All of us have unique situations. Um, some of the judging that is going on on social media um, is just heartbreaking to me. And I hope that all of us can advocate for our individual situation, 
and advocate for our individual students and children in our home, advocate for our teachers, and advocate for ourselves with kindness and lack of judgment. That's what my ask over these next coming weeks is. I ask this of everyone in our community. If there are no other comments on item A5, reopening schools update, we can move on. Well, Mrs. Lund, what, I'll, what I will share is um, we're going to um, be listening very intently uh, to the 12 o'clock news conference that the governor uh, will be undertaking. Uh, the high anticipation uh, throughout the state is that uh, some guidance and directives related to reopening and masks will be shared in that. Um, that may make decisions for us. Should it not, uh, we will convene no later than July 29th to um, solicit from the board the exact uh, uh, directions in which to head. That would give us a little less than three weeks prior to the uh, start of the school year, but we feel confident that we can do that. And we would certainly adjust all timelines for parents um, in making selections should that still be something that's warranted at that time. Uh, nevertheless, we will be communicating uh, next week with parents based on information uh, that may be coming out today. Very good, thank you, Mr. Kelly. Um, so we'll get the rest of this meeting moving so that we are hopefully, fingers crossed, without cutting anybody off, free by noon to watch the governor's address. The next item is item A6, first reading of proposed new board policy BP0470 COVID-19 mitigation plan. This is an information item. Next item on our agenda is B, human resources. Item B1, approval of the personnel report. This is an action item. I'll move the personnel report. Second. Mrs. Tomasian has moved and Mr. Um, Rebus has seconded. Comments, Mr. Dixon. Not at this time. Uh, I approve. Go ahead. I, I got out of sync. I, I, I approve the motion, but you'll call. For okay. That. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dipley. No comments at this time. Mr. Rebus. Uh, no comment. Mrs. Tomasian? None. Roll call vote. Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. Mr. Rebus? Aye. Mr. Dipley? Aye. Mr. Dixon? Aye. Linda Lunn, aye. And the motion carries 5 0. Item B2 Approval of Revised 2020 slash 21 Proposed Student Calendar. This is an action item. So moved. Second. Second. All right. I have a motion by Mr. Diffley and a second by Mrs. Tomasian. Any comments, Mrs. Tomasian? Uh, well, I just I think it's a great idea to have the additional. Um, professional development at the beginning of the school year it will be uh, greatly um, appreciated by staff and I know we'll end up providing a, a better learning opportunity for our students. Mr. Rivas? Uh, no comment. Mr. Dipley? I echo Mrs. Tomasian's uh, comments. Mrs. Mr. Dixon? Uh, this is Linda Lund commenting. Um, I agree with Mr. Tomasi and Mr. Dipley. I also want to do a shout out to MEA and CSEA. I know that you guys have been working hand in hand with district staff to make changes like this to best serve our staff. So thank you so much for your efforts in this area. We can move to a vote now, Mr. Dixon. Aye. Mr. Dipley. Aye. Mr. Rivas. Aye. Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries 5 0. 
Item B3, approval of university agreements. This is an action item. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Diffley and a second by Mr. Dixon. We'll move to comments. Mr. Dixon. Uh, none at this time. Mr. Diffley? None. Mr. Rebus? None. And Mrs. Tomasian? None. Moving to the vote, Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. Mr. Rebus? Aye. Mr. Diffley? Aye. Mr. Dixon? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries 5 0. Item B4, assignment of high school teachers to teach in a departmentalized classroom per education code 44263. This is an action item. So moved. I'll move. Second. Was that you, Mr. Diffley? No, Mr. Dixon. Okay, so I have a motion by Mr. Dixon and a second by Mrs. Tomasian. Any comments, Mrs. Tomasian? None. Mr. Rivas? None. Mr. Diffley? None. Mr. Dixon? Uh, none. Okay, we'll move to the vote. Mr. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mr. Diffley? Aye. Mrs. Domasian? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item B5, this item has been pulled from the agenda. Item B6, approval of provisional internship permit for education specialist credential in mild to moderate for certificated employee Alicia Cartwright. This is an action item. So moved. Second. All right, I've got a motion by Mr. Diffley and a second by Mr. Dixon. Any comments, Mrs. Tomasian? None. Mr. Rivas? Uh, none. Mr. Diffley? None. Mr. Dixon? Uh, none either. And for myself, um, welcome and good job, Mrs. Cartwright. Moving to the roll call vote, Mr. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Dipley? Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries five to zero. Item B7, authorization for speech pathologist Alexander Ramos to be employed under education code 44831 for the 2020-21 school year. This is an action item. I'll move, so move. Seven. Second. All right, I've got a motion by Mrs. Tomasian and a second by Mr. Dixon. Starting with comments, Mr. Dixon. Um, none. Mr. Dipley? None. Mr. Rivas? Uh, no. Mrs. Tomasian? None. Moving to the vote, Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mrs. Mr. Dipley? Aye. And Mr. Dixon? Aye. And Mrs. Melinda Lunn? Aye. And the motion carries five to zero. Welcome and good job, Mr. Ramos. Item B8, second reading and adoption of proposed revisions to board policy BP4119 dot two one dash professional standards slash code of ethics. This is an action item. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Dipley and a second by Mrs. Tomasian. Any comments, Mrs. Tomasian? None. Mr. Rivas? None. Mr. Dipley? None. Mr. Dixon? None at this time. Moving to the vote, Mr. Dixon. Aye. Mr. Diffley? Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries 5 0. C, business and, business and operations. Item C1, approval to renew contract with P&R Paper Supply Company for paper goods and supplies 
for the 2020-2021 school year. This is an action item. I'll move T1. Second. I have a motion by Mrs. Tomasian and a second by Mr. Dixon, correct? Diffley. Diffley. Very good, a second by Mr. Diffley. Any comments, Mrs. Tomasian? None. Mr. Rivas? None. Mr. Diffley? None. Mr. Dixon? None. Moving to the roll call vote, Mr. Dixon? Aye. Mr. Diffley? Aye. Mr. Rivas? Aye. Mrs. Tomasian? Aye. And Linda Lunn, aye. The motion carries five to zero. I'll open it up for just one more final comment. Any comments from the board at this time? Hearing none, we will adjourn at 11.15. Thanks everybody for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everybody, bye-bye. Bye-bye.